normally use to explain behavior. So the way that we feel determines our behavior. So if we're feeling good, we tend to do good. Yeah? So Abraham Lincoln said, if I do good, I feel good. But if we tend to feel good, we tend to do good as well. Yeah? So if we're feeling depressed, people will behave depressed. If they're feeling angry, they will behave like an angry person. They'll show up that way. Yeah? So the areas that influence the state behavior model are physiology, our internal dialogue, our internal pictures, and I've added this one to the model. Normally, those are the three which are used in any explanation. But I've added this to this model, which is environment. This is what a lot of people do. They will use external to change internal. That's what a lot of self-medication is. Self-medication is, isn't it? You know, chocolate cake, coffee. I hate coffee. I use external to change the way I feel. So I can behave differently. But let's just look at the environment. What else is out there in the environment? Well, there's, there's definitely the food. We know that. Drink. Drugs. Sounds. <coughs> Colors. Because some of those have to be filtered through this. The way we talk to ourselves and what we imagine what we think about these people. <coughs> Tomorrow we're going to be doing some stuff with sounds and certainly with some colours and smells. So I will be having an inquiry with the person I'm working with around this. I want to know what's going on. I want to know if there's any toxicity. If there's anything that they need to be aware of that maybe in their model of the world isn't a problem. Do you think the jam could be a problem? A loaf of bread and jam. But for her, that was normal. I think that's an important distinction to have. The distinction between something that's normal, something that somebody's just used to, and something that actually is natural and right as well. <clears throat> and I'm also considering what is it someone has or is doing that we, it would be useful for them to stop. That metaphor you know, if someone's got toxic thinking or drinking too much coffee or drinking too much alcohol, I just think, you know, I'd see that river and I see it getting clogged up. I think, what would it be like if we stop this? If we take this out of the, the process, take this out of the situation? Make sense? And then what else can we put back in? And environmental, we want to look at all of those areas. Water, you know, the drinks, the foods, the right company. Having the right sounds. Yeah, how many of you like that music I was playing earlier on? Mm -hmm. from out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play The Prodigy next. Is that song in the top? Diva from out. I've written her name up on the top. Okay. So I like The Prodigy. We've always to relax. <laughs> <clears throat> Wouldn't necessarily be my choice. So the external sounds change internal states. I mean, Tina's got some tuning forks. We'll be doing some stuff with tuning forks to heal. 
Cool. So what about for you guys? It might be worth having an inquiry for yourself around this, around this area here. Particularly for people that are into coaching, who tend to go straight for this. And a lot of people also forget this area. Yeah, this is a master practitioner we had, Robert Levy Perry, come along. Because we wanted to add in the body works, the physiology aspect to this model. You know, because we could be doing brilliant work up here. You know, we could be able to visualize all sorts of wonderful creative visualization of techniques. But if they're still in the physiology, putting their teeth, grinding their teeth, and creating tensions and stresses in the body, this work quite often can be affected by this. First place I go for is physiology. <coughs> easiest way to change state. Sit how you sit if you were depressed. Oh, at least move. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah? Most of you moved. You had to get into the physiology of depression. Come out of that one. <laughs> yes, how you'd see if you were uh, oh, having the most amazing experience of your life. You get straight to the physiology of it. Yeah? Physiology is the key. Yeah? And there are aspects of the physiology which you really want to pay attention to, which is first one is posture. There's a pretty Charlie Brown cartoon where Charlie's walking along like this, and Lucy, you know, she's the one on the top of the hill with a little psychiatric booth with five dollars, or five, it used to be five cents, I think, so <coughs> five dollars now. He says, Charlie, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm practicing my depressed walk. I said, I find if I do this, it just doesn't work. So this makes it easy for people to do the talking. It also switches off the breathing. So, posture has a profound effect on breathing. But do this with your hands, yeah? There's movement, even if physically they're not able to move, they're mentally still engaged and moving. Yeah. Yeah? Things slow down. Yeah. Death. So alive, there's movement. Yeah? So motion. People are moving, they're alive. So one of the things I would definitely be looking for in the physiology of the person I want to do is, is there any motion? <coughs> motion equals emotion as well. So I might coach someone around that. I'll be looking at how they show up. What is it they're doing? It may not be serving them. It could just be they're used to sit in one posture. And to them it's no big deal. They're not paying attention. 
And they won't necessarily always know what's going on inside. Because, I'll give you an example. I was asked by a group of accountants to do some coaching a while back, a long while back. And they wanted to say which was measurable. Yeah, accountants, aren't they? Yeah. Could you prove? I mean, well, we could ask the people, how do you feel after we've done the coaching? And we go, this is where they are now, this is where they are afterwards. And we go, there's a gap between the two. And therefore, we've done the job. So I said, no, have you got any matrix of any sort? So, well, I'll find out. I'll find something. Well, we'd already done the deal, so I mean, anyway, even if I don't come up with this. And I found something called heart math. Any of you used heart math? No? I love heart math. Yeah. Do you use it on a regular basis? Or no, just no, just... Mark on the old sort of point in it, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's a very simple piece of software. I'm not sure how much is it now, it's about 200 bucks, something like that. And again, when I first <coughs> found out about half map, half map, it was all academic research. Now it's become very much a big marketing business, you know, because they, they've kind of taken off. So I found out about them about 10 12 years ago. <coughs> and you basically put on this little thing on your finger, on your ear. And they have these little exercises that work on the heart resonance. <coughs> so when you're in a relaxed state, the heart will be working in a particular frequency. If you get slightly distressed, it will change. And what they give you is, in fact, I've got some of the music. It's, it's been developed by a guy called Doc Childra, who's not a doc, but his name's Doc, which is kind of cool, I like that. And um, they basically give you some simple breathing exercises and they get you to listen to some music. And this is now big, big business in the States because it's been, they've got so much research material to show that when you listen to the music and you do the breathing exercises, you change your physiology. So much so you can demonstrate and see it on the screen. You can see your heart rate change. Now, I did some experimentation years ago where we got people to step into the pictures of distress and you could see their heart rate change. Yeah? So imagine you're there with your client. And your client comes in and starts telling you, well, yeah, I'm a mother of three, and I've just been diagnosed with cancer, and I don't know what I'm going to do with my children. And they start to tell you the story, which is a sad story. And you're processing it as if you're in the picture. What's it doing to your physiology? Well, if we were to plug you onto the heart map, we'd actually see. The way you're processing external communication is changing internal environment. Now, we experimented with things such as coffee. Now, I'm pretty good at controlling my heart rate. When I do the heart math exercises, they do little things like you have a hot air balloon. So if you relax, the hot air balloon goes up. If you start to talk to yourself, the heart rate will go up and the balloon will come down. And you have to guide it over these little walls and under clouds and over trees. So you, get, you then start to drive your own internal machinery. So it's a great tool for you practicing how to do some self-hypnosis and going into a trance state. So I, I can drive this little hot air balloon up and down. It's really easy. Yeah? If I have a piece of chocolate, it's not so easy. That external chemical changes my internal chemistry. And I have to leave it for about half an hour before I can do the exercise and get a result. A cup of coffee, be a couple of hours. I've never smoked, but I took up smoking once to really check my stop smoking program and found I needed it. <laughs> Don't do that with everything, by the way. Just this one. I thought, this ain't not quite right, so let me try it out from the inside. So I took up smoking for about three months and then realised I was actually doing it on a regular basis and had to take myself through my own stop smoking program and make an adjustment to make sure it really worked. Yeah. That's how you know I don't smoke, because you don't smoke like that. <laughs> heart rate went off the chart. It was almost the same as someone having a panic attack. And we know that because we have people plugged onto it and had panic attacks, so I said spider. And we knew the work was done because we could say the word spider and the heart rate wouldn't change so much. There would still be a change. <coughs> because we cannot not be influenced by external stimuli. The red square, we process it. The blue square, we process it. So much so, there are certain things that we're influenced by that we're not always consciously aware. And as some of you might be aware of the uh, experiments by Robert Cialdini. Robert Cialdini is a social, um, social researcher, and he looks at the way we operate as, in a, as a community. 
and they, it's about persuasion and influence. And he did some experimental research with um, somebody in a lift. There was a guy in a lift who was holding a box of files and a glass, a, a cup, a drink. And you would come along, you'd go into the lift, and there would be this guy there. And you see the guy struggling, what he would do is he'd say, do you mind, would you just hold that? Now most people would reach out and take the cup, wouldn't they? And he would then readjust all the boxes and go, thank you, and take the cup. That was the experiment. He'd then leave the lift and there'd be someone on the outside saying, excuse me, I just want to ask you some questions about what you just experienced in the lift. And the questions they were asked were about what was your opinion about the person in the lift? And there was one thing that changed people's opinions, whether they thought this person was either a dodgy character, someone to be careful of, or was a good character. What do you think it was? I know some of you know the answer, but if you have heard this before. What do you think it was? He handed him a drink. It was the temperature of the drink. If they handed a cold drink with ice, there was something wrong with this character. So the temperature changed the way we felt and the way we interpreted what was going on. If they handed them a warm drink, he was a good guy. Seemed okay. We've been continually influenced by external stimuli that we're not always aware of. The University of Sheffield did some research <coughs> material on, it started off some research material on the portion size of food and how it could be influenced, how much people ate, ate, what we could do to influence the volume of eating. Yeah? They found that if they increased the crockery size, people would eat more. Yeah? But what they also found out as a result of this experimentation was that when people are eating, as they move the cutlery towards them, the heart rate goes up. So if you have a fork, the jagged end of the fork comes towards you. There's a part of you that's processing this sharp implement coming towards you and is responding. If you have plastic cutlery, it's not the same response. Wooden cutlery, if you go to Whole Foods, you can get those little wooden knives and forks. Not the same response. It's more relaxed. This is why we have comfort foods, finger foods. So think of all these things externally that are influencing internal environment. Things that we're not even aware of. Now, in and of itself, having a fork that comes towards you isn't a problem. But if you end up with multiple things happening, that's when it's too easy for the environment to change. And people aren't aware of it because it's just normal. So one of the things I... When I'm coaching someone to do this model, I'll explain this model, and I'll also say to them, I think of the, I think of the human as a container. So, stuff happens, and we respond to it, and we release the adrenaline, the noradrenaline, into all the stress chemistry, the fight or flight chemistry. So the fork comes up, the heart rate goes up, we release stress chemistry. Yeah? <coughs> But that's not a problem if that's allowed to dissipate, to release. But what do most people do? If they've had an experience, a stress experience, they tend to do this, don't they? They tend to think about it. They tend to talk about it. They tend to run those internal movies. So what do they do? They just have the same experience again, but inside their mind. And we know that there's not much difference between the real experience and an imagined experience. Chemically, probably not much at all. Yeah. So what happens is they go through it again and again. And when someone has too much stress, but you know what they're coping with, aren't they? Yeah, I've coped with this. I'm all right. What does it do to our perceptual filters, to the way we see the world? The stressed person starts to behave in a stressed way, and what are they looking for? 
You know that phrase what the thinker thinketh, the prover proving. In hypnosis, is so <coughs> profound. So if someone is stressed, is looking for reasons to be stressed, they'll find the reasons, won't they? Yeah? A depressed person will find the reasons to be depressed. They will look for the proof. The person who's got a knee ache will look for the weather conditions to support that this is the time for the knees to ache. Or not. Yeah? Now the system can cope with this until there's a point where it can't. And that's where, I say to people, that's the point where dis-ease happens. Yeah? So this is in answer to that first question over there, which was, you know, that's setting up. The setup is so important when you're working with someone. I want them to buy into this whole process, and I want them to be compliant, and to understand why the things we're going to do are going to be affected. Yeah? So I'm going to give them these broad models and say, well, our job is to clean up a container. Yeah? There's a point where dis-ease happens. There's that tipping point. So we're going to tip it back. So we're going to coach around all of those areas. Make sense? Any questions about this so far? We'll get you to do some stuff in a minute. Been talking a lot, haven't I? The skills. What skills do you have that you can use in any of these areas? see their physiology. I'll ask them some questions about you know, their lifestyle, environment, and I'll also ask them some questions about you know, anything stress you've been going on in your life, and I'll do a calibration to how they believe they're coping with stress. And then we'll, we'll go in and do some work. Now, you can go in at any of those points. I would tend to go straight in for physiology, because physiology, when someone becomes aware of their physiology, it's something they can just keep adjusting and keep moving back to a place of balance. But what about the rest? What about the internal dialogue? What about the internal pictures? Observation. Yeah, that, that's okay in terms of our skill sets. What about the client skill sets? <coughs> what strategies do they have to deal with the stress that they have? Yeah, look at that. Yeah. I'm, I'm one of the areas I like to go for first okay, is with the internal dialogue. The internal dialogue tends to be a, a really quick and easy place to go. The reason is that most people, when you start talking about representations or any type of strategies, they, they kind of don't really know what we're talking about. But you talk to people about their internal talk, they know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You know that voice? Which one? Yeah, that's what people say. Which one? Choose one. You know that voice when you doubt you're going to get well? Not you. This is a. <laughs> when I'm working with someone in a healing space, they will probably be inside their head worrying or doubting, and maybe even worry or doubting the work we're going to do. So I'm going to work and switch that on. First place I'm going to go. Yeah? Do you guys know how to do that? This is yes. This is no. Who does know how to switch internal dialogue? Is that a show of hands? Higher. A half a group. Oh, now I've got a few more going in. All right. 
Has anyone in this room still got an internal voice where they question or doubt? Yeah? Okay. Mm. All right, well, well, let's, let's go and do some stuff, shall we? So let's, let's do this quickly. So you get a chance to do it so that you can do it with someone else, yeah? So I only do this if you do have a voice that you use to doubt things. Now, it's okay to doubt things. Yeah? But let's say there's a situation where it's not useful to doubt something. Okay? So I want you to talk to yourself in a way where you might be doubting something that would be useful for you to do. You got that? This is yes. Okay? And again, notice the <coughs> internal dialogue, how it affects kinesthetics. How's it feel? But it's good to be able to do it so that you can yeah. calibrate to someone else's. Good. That's a good plan. That's a good plan. What other feelings do you get? Fuzzy. Fuzzy? Restless. Restless. Yeah. Maybe some of your expressions like. Yeah. Okay, first thing I want to do is notice the location of the voice. Go for the submodalities. The location of the voice, point to where that voice is, the doubting voice. Yeah. Notice the volume of the voice. <coughs> is it loud? Is it quiet? <coughs> is it your voice? Is it more than my voice? And put gaps between every single word. Well, conscious talk to you. Then with the gaps, stretch every gaps and with the word stretched. I want you to change the tone of voice. So, every word Shake yourself out. Did you all have some chocolate cake? Mm -hmm. Carrot cake, yeah. That's the carrot cake, chocolate cake breaker <coughs> Yeah. Okay, now try to talk to yourself in that voice. What happened? That's the, that's the knowing look. So. Anyone still able to talk to themselves in that voice? how quick and easy it is. What we're doing is we're changing the protein structure of the brain by doing that. So consider your clients coming for healing. If you hadn't done this, they'd be going out there going, chatting away without necessarily knowing they're doing all this internal dialogue, which is changing internal chemistry. Make sense? <coughs> now I don't want them going away and working at this. Because if we gave them this <coughs> task, what they have to do? They'd have to listen to the voice in order to get rid of the voice. Yeah? So what we're doing, if we ask them to do this, is we get them to practice doubting themselves. That would be ridiculous. Yeah? So, but I do want them to practice <coughs> going quiet inside. Because quiet mind, quiet body. I know some of you have done this with 
something before, but just listen to this sound. And when I nod my head, I want you to see it. Okay? Just listen to the sound. And there's a rhythm to this. Okay? So I'm going to mark out six sounds. And there'll be short sounds, and I'm going to do the same sound slightly longer. So the sound is... seconds is the average time for you to go inside and shut the fuck up. It's a technical phrase, isn't it? Yeah. Eight seconds. But I'm in an enlightened group here, so I didn't <coughs> and I forgot my watch, so I'd have had to look around and watch the clock to test you and I'd have missed you all. <coughs> but quite often we get a group of people and say, right, close your eyes, put your hands up, and go quiet inside. And as soon as you start talking to yourself, put the hand down. As soon as the thought pops in, so off you go. About eight seconds, and most of the hands have gone down. It's incredible. Yeah? So we can't manage the thinking, there's too, just too many. Because there's 64,500 seconds in a day. And if we're supposed to have 50,000 thoughts a day, that's almost one per second. I always wonder how they calculated that. I just think somebody with a very fast speaker. Uh, there's a thought, oh, there's another one. Whatever. And put themselves in a loop, didn't they? That's it. Just by doing the counting. <coughs> but I always think this, this thinking, is connected to this. So if we have too much of this, we end up with too much of that. So if we slow this down, we slow this down. Slow down the thinking, we slow down. Especially the stressing thinking, we slow down the stressy chemistry. What we want is somebody not filling up the river themselves. Make sense? So, one of the first things we do after the physiology, change the physiology, teach them to go quiet inside. That technique is called shush, shush. <laughs> It's a sound we're all used to hearing. <coughs> We've all heard. If you listen to an ultrasound, it's a sound that we've all heard in the womb. It's a safe sound. It's a comforting sound. It's a relaxing sound. I don't want somebody to switch off their internal dialogue. If they're inside their head, if they're at home worrying about their cancer or their leukemia, and guess what they probably will be? I want them to be able to stop doing that as much as they can. So that way they're not pouring more toxicity into the system when we're trying to clean it up. Now, what we're looking to do... Reduce this. Every client I've ever worked with with eczema or psoriasis, <coughs> this point, that's when something breaks down, and with those skin conditions, it will be manifested in the skin. Yeah. That's the toxicity coming out. As soon as they start to relax, as soon as they start to 
breathe again, as soon as they start to go quiet inside, as soon as they start to stop worrying the same way, and just think about things without any stress. It takes a moment in time, so it's not a quick one, it's not a quick change. Yeah? They don't suddenly come out of a 90 minute session and their skin's cleared up. I haven't had that. Yeah? But what will happen is as this <coughs> empties, the body doesn't need to use the largest organ of the body, the skin, to get rid of the toxicity. The skin starts to change. Make sense? Very little time. Good. So that's the model I work to. And I want you to think about the skills that you already have. You know, when we talk about skills, we could go back, we could go to switch patterns, we could go into logical levels, we could talk about all the NLP techniques you've got, but I'd like to map it to that model. Yeah, we could do a practitioner training, you know, a mini prep training, and show you all the skills you could use to change people's internal reps. But that's pointless, you kind of already know that. Yeah? But I want you to think about how could you stop somebody doing internal pictures causing distress. Make sense? Now one of the other things I'm going to do with them at the very beginning is to deal with the beliefs they have. So between now and lunch, I want you to work with someone and to have a three minute inquiry with that person and ask them what beliefs would you like to have that would be useful for you to be the most curious, positive, empowered, tenacious, resourceful you that you could be in that healing space. And to think about that you. Now, who has not done a belief switch with anyone this week? I'm not saying this is how it will <coughs> show up in these locations, but the way to do a belief switch, or how I like to do a belief switch, is positive belief, and let's say wishy washy belief. And then ask them to think about them as most curious, most resourceful, most tenacious whatever resources they want. Yeah, so you have that couple of minutes inquiry, what, what would you like? Yeah. Then ask them to think about it, and let's say it's here. We want it to be there, don't we? But what we do first is we send it off, and put it in there. We want to put it into a wishy-washy. Right? There's a reason for that. The gap between here and here, the delta, the difference, the bigger the difference, the more powerful the impact on the belief change. So a change from here to here doesn't have the same impact as the change, if this one's here, from there to there. Does that make sense? I love use the red pen. So you move this one to wishy-washy, and then you move it from wishy-washy <coughs> into positive. Everyone clear on that? I'll do it again with the black pen. Because the black pen's louder. And I'm not saying these are gonna these represent the location. You have to work with the human being in front of you, okay? <coughs> positive. Wishy washy belief, and this is the belief of you being the best you you can be in that healing space, in that coaching space. So you do a belief switch, and remember, with belief with swishes, yeah, you don't want to move it across the midline of the body because it tends to just flip back. Okay? So you move it off into the distance and then bring it back. If it has to cross the midline of the body, it will do so if you move it off into the distance. Do you know the first one that? Yeah? 
אבל הוא ריסק אותי. There's a most important part of everything. When we're doing swish bags, if we move stuff across the midline of the body, it tends to ping it back. The brain goes, no, hold on, and we'll shut, shut it back, okay? But if you move it off into the distance and bring it to here, it will accept that. Make sense? Yeah? Everyone get that? <coughs> what we do is we move the thing we'd like to believe, and it might even be here, it's there, then leave it. If it's there and matched to the strong belief, just leave it, yeah? Well, actually, no, you could do faith. You could experiment with faith, yeah? <coughs> so you move it off midline, off into the distance, into wishy washy. First bit, and then from wishy washy, off into positive belief. Yeah. Lock it in place. And the thing with these belief switches, you want to do it fast, don't you? Lock it in place. Yeah. Make sense? Cool. So I, I think of beliefs as um, <coughs> just an idea. It's like a tabletop. It's just, a, it's just a free floating idea, isn't it? I believe in this. Well, I've got an idea. Now, in order for it to be a strong belief, we need lots of support. It's a pretty good free dimension for that. The more legs supporting the belief, the stronger the belief. So if someone has a strong belief which is getting in the way of the work that we're doing, how could we change that? Not the, yeah. the, the answer to it is quickly. The best way to do it is quickly. We'll take all the legs out. Try this out, just an experiment. Um, think of a limiting belief you have. Maybe around <coughs> your ability to do healing work, if you have it. Okay? And if not, choose, choose another subject. Okay? Got something? Now, when you think of it, I want you to notice the sub data. I want you to notice the location of the picture, the size of the picture. Is it one picture or more than one picture? You got a representation of that? Yeah? This is yes? Everyone got something? Now, I want you to try this as an experiment. I want you to, you might need to close your eyes to this. I want you to imagine floating out of your body. <coughs> float to the other side of the picture. And turn around inside your mind and look at the other side of that belief. What's on the other side of the belief? Have you all done that? Okay, if you've done that, just open your eyes. What's on the other side of the belief? Nothing, yeah? Blank, yeah? What did you get? What did you get? I got the opposite. The opposite. Anyone else get the opposite? Yeah? Isn't that cool? How many of you have thought, I wonder what's on the opposite side of that belief? Sometimes it's a blank, which means you've got a space to create. Sometimes it will just be the opposite. So how do you change your belief quickly? So where's your limiting belief? Because we're going to call it a limited belief. You got it? Yeah? That's the picture? Yeah. Just there? Can you hold it? Yeah. Okay. So I've got the edge of it. Okay. Look at this. What's there now? It's gone. Fuzzy. Yeah. So I want you now to try and think of it. Okay. Yeah? Let me look at it. Try it. You try it. Yeah. Okay. 
How does that feel? Yeah. I mean, you should, you should be watching. Yeah, you should be watching the physiology. Yeah. Okay. Just let it settle. It's very strange. Yeah. Yeah. Why is something missing? Yeah. Yeah. So guess what? What would it be useful for you to believe instead? You got that? Mm -hmm. Where's that picture? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I want you to bring that up to here and snap it back to there. Got that in? Mm -hmm. Let that settle. Okay, shake yourself out. Right. Now think about that. How's that feel? It's beginning to settle. It's beginning to settle. Yeah, yeah. It will set into the neurology. Yeah. So let's consider what we just did. Yeah. Now, for some people who take the limitation and spin it around very quickly like that, they'll end up with the positive, yeah, the new belief already locked in place, or even the gap. Or sometimes it just <coughs> it's like taking all those legs away, which is why something's missing, and that will feel different. That will feel strange and weird. Yeah. Maybe even unsettling because this is an idea. <coughs> The thinking, the issues, the thinking up here, they're in the tissues. Yeah? So the thinking is manifested into the neurology. Yeah? So when we change this, the neurology will feel different. That's a good thing, because you've been walking around and carrying this limiting belief. And it's a limiting belief that it's not too useful. Yeah? But it was quite a strong limiting belief. So when she thought of the opposite, it wasn't in the same place, was it? It was somewhere else. It was over here. Now, because this was strong, we're not interested in content, we're interested in process. This is where she holds on to strong beliefs, even though it might be limited. So I moved this one from here and locked it in place there. Does that make sense? Everyone get this? So we're looking a little bit puzzled. But that's why you're going to do it in a minute. You know you're doing good work because people will feel different. They'll go, that feels weird. Yeah? The new belief needs time to settle into the neurology. Make sense? So this is what I want you to do. Not necessarily that bit, but I just want you to be aware of that. I don't want you doing that bit, yeah? But you might want to experiment with yourself and just say, <coughs> okay, what other beliefs have I got that are limiting? What happens if I look at the other side of that one? Now I've got new possibilities. But if I take it and... <laughs> that is so easy. <laughs> and spin it around. Ah, where did that belief go? Cool. So this is your experiment. To do this bit. By lunchtime you want to have installed in you all of the most resourceful beliefs that you could have. So when you sharpen that coaching space for someone, it's going to be easy, it's going to be quicker than they will ever imagine. It's inevitable. Yeah? You're going to be curious about what's going on, tenacious enough to get things done, maybe indifferent to the outcome, but on a way where you don't care. So it's up to you to decide what goes into that belief. Because, you know, you're all different. What's important to you may not be as important to somebody else. Make sense? Cool. <laughs> so you've got ten minutes of peace.